Groovy. Hey gang, it's been a few years since I've done one of these computer setup vids, and it's time for another one, and I'm challenging myself on this one, which I'll explain at the very end of the video. A bunch of stuff has changed here, as you can see. There's a lots of new hardware at play, and I'm going to try to go through it all. This may end up being a fairly long video, so I'll do my best to index it with time codes at the, in the description before publishing it. That way you can skip through it if you want. Now before I go too much further, let me address something that's likely going to tilt a few of you. Yes, I know my cabling is messy and untidy. And I honestly don't care. I've said it and written it before. I'll tidy cables up if they get in my way, or if they might cause some sort of issue coming in contact with something. Otherwise, I sincerely don't care. With that out of the way, let's pan across the desk here. On the far left side of my uplift sit-stand desk, you'll see a MacBook Pro. That actually belongs to my employer, and no, I don't work for Juniper. I'm fortunate enough in that I get to work from home 100% of the time. I took their laptop, which is an early 2019 15-inch model, connected a couple of CalDigit TS3 Plus docks to it, and then connected those docks to my displays, a keyboard, a mouse, and the cabled network in the office. I'm not going to get into the laptop too much since it's my employer's, not mine. Suffice it to say, it integrates perfectly with the rest of the gear on my desk. The three displays you see here are 27-inch 4K, and the center one is an Asus PG27UQ. That's the first of the 4K panels that could do 144Hz over DisplayPort. I got that when they were first released back in mid-2018 and have been happily gaming in 4K ever since. The two flank displays are LG 4K 60Hz panels, and they're also connected via DisplayPort to the PC. Under the center display, two Unicomp 101 buckling spring keyboards. The darker one is the Mac layout, and the other is for the PC. Both are built almost identically to the old IBM Model M keyboards, ones I've used and loved for decades. There's no better keyboard type in the world, in my opinion. Buckling springs are, in fact, better than your Cherry MX switches. So there. I decided to do two keyboards versus one in a KVM because it's just a bit easier to keep the Mac and key PC keyboards separate. The keys get remapped ever so slightly between the PC and the Mac. For instance, the Windows key on the PC keyboard becomes the Mac's command key, but it's not in the same exact position. It's swapped with the Alt key. This isn't show-stopping. It's just a little annoying. And in the end, I also don't want my gaming key presses going through a KVM that I know will fail right during the middle of a game. That's just how my bad luck works. So I went with two keyboards. And two mice. For the Mac, a Logitech Wireless G900. And for the PC, a Logitech Wireless G502. I've always enjoyed gaming with G502 mice, and now that they're wireless, all the better. As we move forward, further towards the right side of the desk, my brand new 2019 Mac Pro. I'm going to spend some time later in this video getting into that. Suffice it to say, I love the thing, and I'm presently editing this video on it. And finally, just off the desk, the beast, my gaming rig. Let's talk about that one first. When the X299 platform was released in 2017, I picked up an Asus Rampage 6 Extreme motherboard. On that, I mounted an Intel Core i9-7900X CPU and 64 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance DDR4 RAM, which I have overclocked to 4 gigahertz. The CPU was previously overclocked to 4.7 gigahertz on all cores, but after getting the Mac and moving all my video editing to it, I decided to reset the CPU to its default clock and power. 7900X CPUs, when overclocked, run hot, even when cooled by water. They work fine, they just get a little too warm. At its default clock, it still runs my FPS games perfectly, and that's all it needs to do now. I have the Asus DIMM.2 module in there, though it may be tricky to see. On it, I have two Samsung NVMe drives. The main OS and apps drive is the Samsung 1TB 970 Pro. I also have my slightly older Samsung 1TB 960 Pro, which I'm using for extra storage. Both are quite quick, of course. For GPUs, I have a pair of NVIDIA Founder Editions 2080 Ti cards in SLI. I'll always do SLI for as long as NVIDIA supports it. Single card performance is getting really damn good, but it's still kind of hard to hit 4K at 140 frames per second with one card. Two cards can do it though. And yes, both cards are overclocked and overvolted, and their memory is also overclocked. The cooling in my PC is hyper overengineered. I often quote Adam Savage from the Mythbusters if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. 
my cooling is overdone. The CPU and VRMs are cooled by the appropriate EK blocks, as you can see here. The block is fed from an EK Revo D5 pump and res combo unit. The water egresses the block and follows this long path around the case and then up to the alpha cool 480mm by 60mm radiator mounted on the top. The radiator is in a push-pull fan configuration with 8 Noctua 120mm fans, and they're spinning in a fixed 650 RPMs or so. That never changes. Once through the dual-pass radiator, the water returns back to the reservoir. The two GPUs are cooled by another independent loop. They're fed from a second EK pump res unit that's sitting in the back. Once the water egresses the second GPU block, it loops around to the back of the case and into the two rads back there. And if we look on the other side of the case, we can see another alpha cool 480mm by 60mm, also in push-pull with eight more Noctuas. The water leaves the top rad and heads to the bigger rad on the bottom, an alpha cool 560mm by 60mm. It's in a push-pull with eight knock to 140mm fans, out of the rad, around the case, and back to the reservoir. Like the CPU fans, the GPU fans are spinning at a constant RPM. The goal, of course, keep the kit cool and do so with as little noise as possible. And I think I've achieved that. The fans and pumps are driven by a pair of Aqua Aero 6 XT controllers. I can drive the fan and pump speeds from their app that runs in Windows, and it saves the settings to the controller's NVRAM so that it's on the moment the PC boots and doesn't have to wait for the OS to boot. Finally, at every place I could, I have quick disconnects on the tubing. I like how good hard tubing looks in a PC, but I don't like how difficult it is to swap hardware. You have to drain the entire loop. With soft tubing and quick disconnects, swapping out GPUs or CPUs or radiators or fans or whatever becomes very simple. The case breaks my heart. I special ordered this Case Labs Magnum THW10 just in time. A year or two ago, Case Labs closed their doors for good, which kills me. They made, in my opinion, the best PC cases ever. The problem is that each one was custom built and, there's no, and that's no way to run a business where volume is king. Anyway, I bought this beast so that I could house all of the rads and fans. That was always the plan. Have more cooling than PC hardware in it. If there's anything I dislike about the Magnum, it's how the power supply mounts. I don't really like how they have it this far away from the center of the case. I understand why it's there, so that the power supply's fan has easy access to the vent on the door but I think having it mounted further inboard would have been so much better and allow for shorter power cables. That's it. Otherwise, this is the case I'll use forever, or at least until EATX boards are no longer available. I prefer doing everything I possibly can in macOS. The only exception is playing games. For that, I'll always go to a PC. Working, playing on the web, email, and video editing, along with anything else, are just more comfortable for me on a Mac. I'm a Unix guy at heart, and having quick access to a Unix shell is a lifesaver to me. The problem is that I don't much care for iMacs. I really don't like all-in-one desktop systems. So you'll never see me with an iMac. The previous Mac Pro, the 2013 trash can as it was called, was a piece of junk. I actually replaced my old Tower Mac Pro with the trash can Mac because I thought it was going to usher in a new paradigm for Apple. It just didn't pan out for them, and it was a turd of a Mac in my opinion. I, and I really disliked having all of my extra storage in external enclosures, so I sold it and migrated all of my editing to the PC, which sucked. But there's a new Mac Pro. It's a fully modular tower with real PCIe slots and easily swappable hardware. It's fairly spendy, but I wanted one, so I got it. I'm not going to spend any time justifying its purchase in this video. I wrote a blog entry describing the decision and some of the configuration bits. I'll leave that link in the description below. I got the 3.2 GHz 16 core unit with the base 32 GB of RAM and the AMD Radeon Pro Vega 2 GPU. The OEM storage is the one terabyte option, which is technically two 512 GB SSDs striped together in hardware. I also purchased two aftermarket 32 GB DIMMs and bumped the system RAM up to 96 GB. The PCIe slots are next. The first card you see here on the top is the OEM I.O. card. It's got two USB Type-A ports and two Thunderbolt 3 ports. 
Those Thunderbolt ports will output video assuming you have an MPX gra graphics module installed. The next card down is an aftermarket 4-port USB Type-A card. I figured I might need a few more Type-A ports and wanted to make sure I had enough ports on the Mac itself. I've seen issues with certain devices just not working well when connected to hubs, even powered ones. So I wanted the option for more USB ports on, in the system. And the rest of the internal upgrades are all storage based. Promise makes this rail kit called the J2i. It comes with the cable that has SATA and Apple's proprietary 10 pin Molex on one end of it and two combo SATA data and power connectors on the other end. The product also comes with an eight terabyte spinner drive that I'll never use in my Mac. Instead, I have mounted two of my old Samsung Evo 850 2 terabyte SSDs in it, and I put them into a 4 terabyte RAID 0 volume. The Mac exports this drive to the PC so that when I'm recording game footage on my PC, it just gets dumped directly to the volume. We go back to the PCIe slots, we see another small card here. Inside it is a single Samsung SM951 512 gigabyte M.2 drive. It's not an NVMe drive, just an older M.2 form factor. It's quick enough though, and I have it mounted as scratch face for video editing. And finally, the two beasts. They're both High Point SSD 7101A cards. Each one has four Samsung 970 Evo Plus 2 terabyte NVMe drives on them. Using High Point's driver, I configured each card to be an eight terabyte stripe and then mirrored them on top of one another. Mac OS just sees a single eight terabyte volume. I keep my home directory along with video projects and some source material on this volume. It's silly fast too. I ran a quick Blackmagic disk speed test on the volume while I was recording the desktop video to it using OBS Studio. You can see the impressive read and write speed shown. But just to validate that it is a bit quicker than shown, I ran another test without recording the desktop video. Not bad, huh? When I purchased the new Mac Tower, I decided that I wanted to share the laptop's mouse keyboard and a few other peripherals with it. I picked up a little two-way USB 3 switch that it can allow two different computers to share four USB devices. You can see it sitting there under the right display. I figured I'd never be using both the Works laptop and the Mac Pro at the same time, so there was no reason the two Macs couldn't share some peripherals. The center display only has a single HDMI input along with its DisplayPort one. And that's a bit limiting, so it required another switch. One HDMI switch to the rescue, which you can see sitting next to one of the laptop's Thunderbolt docks. This lets me switch the center display between the laptop and the Mac Pro. Lots to talk about audio here. I'm a bit of an audio nerd, and at one point in my recent past, I was streaming video games to either Twitch, YouTube, Mixer, or all of them. I really wanted a stage-ready, feature-filled mixer to run all the sound for the streams, so I saved my pennies and I got this behemoth you see under the desk. It's a Mackie DL32R digital mixer, and I've got it mounted in a small 4RU rack and carrying case. I'm no longer streaming because no one wants to watch someone as bad as I am play games, but that's okay. The mixer is still heavily used, as you can see. Let's start with the PC. Under the two GPUs, I have a Creative Sound Blaster AE9 sound card. I'm a huge fan of the Sound Blaster line, and the AE9 is their latest top dog. Prior to that, I was using their previous top dog, which was the Sound Blaster ZXR. I actually had it from the point it was released in 2013 until I replaced it in mid-2019. That's a good stretch. I like how Sound Blasters work in games, and the new software that runs on the AE9 does a bang-up job with virtual surround sound. I have it outputted via its RCA line, lines out to the mixer. The AE9 also comes with an external box that handles all microphone input, headphone output, and even has RCA lines in in the back. It connects to the back of the AE9 via a mini HDMI cable. The mixer sends a stereo out, output mix back to the Sound Blaster via the RCA lines in. That's so that when I speak into my microphone while playing games, my buddies can hear me in comms. The Mackie also has a USB port that I have connected to the same PC. This creates 16 stereo outputs and 16 stereo inputs for the PC, almost like having 16 entirely new virtual sound cards. I've assigned one of them to my web browser. If you look at the control console running on my iPad, you'll see a fader set called browser. While YouTube is playing in the background, you'll note the browser meter is bouncing. That lets me independently control browser volume right from the mixer, or even mute it. That was handy while I was gaming with various streamers. I'd have their stream running minimized in the background, but I could hear it. When we got into a game, I could easily mute their stream so that all I could hear was them in comms. Speaking of comms, I have another channel set aside just for that. I bind apps like TeamSpeak and Discord to that, 
and can independently and easily control the volume of the comms right from the mixer's console. What about the two Max? Well, I've panned across this a few times, but this is the Sound Blaster X7 external USB DAC. It also has an ADC in it so that it can handle sound input and output. It's based off the same DAC that Creative built using the older ZXR Carve. Like the PC, the external DAC has both in its outputs and inputs home run back to the mixer. In fact, it's through this device that I'm recording this voiceover right now. I have two different micro USB cables running to the back of it. One goes to the laptop and the other to the Mac Pro. I tried running the DAC through the same USB switch that the keyboard and mouse are connected to, but that introduced a lot of audio distortion, crackling, and other problems. So I have to have two different cables that I swap. It's not ideal, but it works. And what about the outputs so that I can hear what's going on? Well, first and foremost are my headphones. They are the Sennheiser H HD820 cans, and they're connected to the Sennheiser HDV820 amp sitting on top of the mixer. That's fed from a pair of stereo, from a mixer's stereo outputs. I also have a studio monitor spread around the area. There are five Mackie MR524 monitors spread about in an attempt to do 5.1 surround sound. I know the rear monitors don't look like they're properly positioned, but they are. When I'm playing a single player game and don't need the precise audio location of my opponents, I prefer to play with the monitors and use real surround sound. The PC surround card also has rear right left outputs as well as a center and sub output. Those are also all home run back to the mixer, and the mixer drives the monitors as needed, including the sub on the floor. And to capture my awful sounding voice, I use one of two microphones. The first is the big Rode broadcaster mounted on their mic arm. That's what I'm speaking into right now. I also have a Shure GLDX4 wireless lav mic set up for online meetings. When I'm working, I attend a large number of online meetings with my coworkers, and the audio can be done through the Mac versus dialing a telephone. So that I can move around in my office while I'm in the meeting, I have a set of Bluetooth headphones and I use the Shure lav mic. If you made it all the way through this video, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe got some ideas for your own office builds. Personally, I can see some upgrades in the medium term. For the PC specifically, it's sounding a lot like Uncle Jensen is about to release new NVIDIA GPUs this year. If he does, I'll jump on a pair of them again. I've had the 2080 Ti cards for two years as of the summer of 2020, so it's about time. As for the displays, Asus and Acer both showed off 32-inch versions of the 4K 144Hz LCDs. I like my 27-inch displays, but I'd prefer 32-inch 4K displays instead. So we'll see what happens with the release of those panels. But that's it. And now for the challenge that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. I wanted to try and record this video with a real cinema camera. As shown here, and recorded via my iPhone, I used the new Canon EOS C500 Mark II. It's Canon's newest fully modular cinema level camera, fitting right in between their Monster C7 and the much loved C300. Full framed, 5.9K at 60 FPS. It's gorgeous. And the video it records is too. No, I don't own this monster. Brand new, it's about 16K, and that's without the lens. Instead, I rented it for a long weekend from lensrental.com along with the Canon 2470 lens that's attached to it. The camera is vastly more capable than the idiot making this video, but hopefully it wasn't too obvious that I didn't know what I was doing. Let me know what you think. Later.